Welcome back. In this video, part three of the Track Saw Workshop, well, there's just one more check that I want to do before we start using that saw in anger. That's coming up next. So in part two, we got the saw up and running really well. It's dialed into the rails really nicely. Uh, we've got that splinter guard cut back, so we know exactly where our cut line's going to be. We know how to set the depth of cut on the depth scale, and we know that we need to allow for the thickness of the rail in that cut as well. Uh, there's only one more check that I'd like to do, really, before we can start using the saw in earnest, and that's to make sure that the saw's cutting square. And by square, I mean when the blade comes down as you plunge it, it gives you a nice square edge, a perpendicular edge, uh, to the cutting surface. Uh, unfortunately, that's a really easy test to make. So to check this for square, to start with you need the thickest piece of man-made board you can find. 22 or 25 mil MDF is absolutely perfect for this. Man-made because it's virtually guaranteed to be flat and stable, so it won't change as you cut it. And all we're going to do, we've got a 6 mil spoiler board down here, and we're just going to line this up and basically make a short, cut a short strip off this, uh, and then we'll just check that for square. So yeah, I think the uh, dust collection leaves a little bit to be desired on this particular saw. Uh, but we've got a nice straight clean cut there. There's two ways you can go on this. You can either use a square, and then the traditional way, check it against the light, that looks actually pretty good. Or a really easy way to do it is just to flip this over and butt the two edges together and see how gappy it is, if at all. And that is actually really good. So when it comes to using your saw in earnest and actually managing the depths of cut, uh, what we did when we trimmed back the splinter guard was almost perfect. Uh, what you need to be aiming for is about 3mm deeper than the material you're cutting. So for example, this piece of 22mm board we just cut uh, and that I've got down here, plus the 5mm of the track uh, gives 27mm uh, and then 3mm more means we can set the depth of cut to uh, 30 mil exactly for this. Uh, and the reason for that is if you think of a, a, a circular saw, all these little teeth are like tiny little blades. Each one of these is like a tiny, tiny little blade. Uh, and as they turn, they slice through the material. And when it gets to the, the bottom of the cut, that's the deepest part of the cut, you want those blades to slice through but not actually come out of the material. So you want the blade to be contained within the material and a 3mm depth of cut over and above the depth of the material and your guide rail is almost perfect for that. Let me show you what I mean. Now I know this sounds like a load of old pony because that's exactly what I thought when somebody told me about this, but I tried it and you do genuinely get a better cut for this. Look, as, and just so as we're clear, yes, we are unplugged, thank you very much. Um, so as we plunge down, at its maximum point here, the teeth of the blade, the bottom of the tooth, will pierce the bottom face of the board, but the top of the tooth, just here, doesn't. So this bit comes down, but this bit stays within the board body. And what you get is a continuous sort of slicing motion without the individual teeth punching out and making a mess. So that's a pretty good rule of thumb for most cuts, uh, about 3mm over and above the depth of cut. Uh, feel free to disbelieve me, feel free to try it yourself. I thought it sounded like a load of nonsense when I first heard it, but I've tried it and it really does work well. Uh, the other thing of course is uh, by having less blade in the material, it means you're using less of the blade, or the blade is working less hard. Uh, so it'll make your blades last a little bit longer. Uh, as always, of course, there, there's uh, an exception to this rule, uh, and that is for plunge cuts. For plunge cuts, where you're cutting on the inside of a board, where you're doing a, uh, a cutout, say, then you need to be plunging at the maximum depth, and there's a very good reason for that. Let me show you. So let's say we want to make a plunge cut just here. You remember in part one, because of the circular saw blade, uh, you don't go all the way through, you get, 
you only get the maximum depth of cut at the center of the blade. So if we were make, to make this cut at normal depth, just to get through as we were before, this is what we get. So if this is a cutout in something, this is how much we'd have to finish off by hand. At the top, not much because we can get close to the line, but at the bottom, all this would have to be removed by hand, or by a multi-master, or whatever method you're going to use. On the other hand, if we set our depth of cut to the maximum, Well, that's how much we'd have to remove by hand. A lot less. So you don't get a better cut as such, making your plunge cuts at maximum depth, but you do make life easier for yourself when it comes to finishing off those corners. Now, when it comes to blade choice, uh, uh, certainly with the blades that are supplied with the tool, at the entry level, you're pretty much stuck with a 24 tooth blade. That seems to be what comes with all the sort of entry level tools as you go higher up the stack and pay more for your tools, uh, you tend to get a 48 to uh, tooth blade, certainly starting from Makita. Uh, and DeWalt and Festool and Maffel all come with 48 tooth blades and all the entry level saws that I've seen uh, come with 24 tooth blades. Maybe the tweener saws come with 36 tooth blades, I don't know. Um, uh, nothing inherently wrong with the 24 tooth blades, a little bit coarse uh, for a fine finish in man-made boards. I, mostly swapped to what Festool call a universal blade for the uh, TS55 track saws uh, and they've got a 28 tooth, uh, uh, that's a 28 tooth blade. So uh, I haven't seen any significant difference between that and the 48 tooth blade in MDF uh, but if you are using birch ply or maybe a thin veneered board you'll definitely see a difference especially on the waist side. Now, I made a couple of cuts earlier on uh, in some birch bar and some thin veneered board, and you can see the difference between the, the good side and the waist side very clearly. Uh, one way around this is to do a scoring cut. Uh, I called the, when we were trimming the uh, splinter guard down, a, a, a scoring cut. Scoring cut's just a, a, a shallow pass, basically. Uh, there are some saws that have a scoring facility built in. Uh, this one doesn't, the Festool doesn't. Uh, the Titan did, I think, and some of the other saws do. Um, it, it's basically a preset which lets you uh, cut to a you know two or three mil pass. And all that does, it literally scores the timber. It scores the, the fibers, cuts those clean through, and then you make a second pass without moving the blade uh, at full depth. But I've just done a, a quick scoring cut in some 12 mil birch ply as well. And again, you can see the difference quite clearly between the uh, uh, between the two edges, but it's a much better finish on the waist side. Why is the waist side important? Because you might want that if you've cut a strip of timber off a full sheet, you might be cutting shelves and the uh, the waist of one end becomes the good end of another shelf, so you want a, a good clean cut on both sides. The other option, of course, is to change the stock blade to something a little bit better. And I've got a 48 tooth blade, which I'm going to pop in this saw now, and we'll see if that makes a significant difference. So when it comes to blade changes on a circular saw, they're all the same, but they're all different. Uh, on this one, there's no locking position for it. Uh, with the Festool and the Maffel, I know, when you plunge the saw, you can pull a lever, which locks it in place. You don't get that luxury <laughs> on the entry level. Uh, they require you to set the plunge depth to 25mm, uh, and then obviously, with the saw unplugged, uh, you release it and plunge it down, and that then exposes uh, the little holding screw. And we can... Oop. Last plunging with our third hand, we can hit the spindle lock and then we can undo that. That'll take off the retaining screw. And the flange. And we can just pop the blade out.
It's worth checking as well. Uh, this is a 160 mil blade, uh, and the one I'm replacing it with is as well. Uh, some of them are 165 mil. Uh, I think the Makita is, but this is a, a 160 mil. 48 tooth blade from Trend. Uh, Trend gave me this last year, they sent it to me for trial. Uh, I haven't got around to doing anything with it yet, but I think it's a good, a good use of it here today. So once again, uh, the same thing in reverse. Is that now, as well as the size of the blade the other thing you've got to watch out for is the thickness the kerf of the blade uh, uh, I just noticed the work zone is actually a 2.4 millimeter kerf whereas the uh, trend is a 2.2 millimeter the same as the Festool so this blade is going to be slightly narrower that affects the uh, splinter guard on your guide rails is all if you have a, if you put a thicker blade in then obviously that's going to trim your uh, splinter guard back a bit more uh, with the thinner one the cut line will be a fifth of a millimeter off um, you can decide if that's worth recutting your splinter guard or not no, I'm not going to bother but uh, let's have a quick trial of this and see if the uh, 48 tooth blade cuts better I've got an idea it might So I've got to confess there's not uh, as much in that as I thought there would be, as I expected there to be, between the 48 tooth and the 24 tooth blade uh, in a straight cut on the waist side anyway. A bit more splintering if anything on the uh, 24 tooth actually. Uh, it is a different piece of birch ply but even so. Um, uh, on the scoring cut though, uh, the 48 tooth blade did much better. Uh, in fact the scoring cut is looks better even uh, than the uh, side of the cut that was under the splinter guard, which does make me question whether that splinter guard is actually doing anything. Uh, as I said uh, in part one, it looked like it was sort of curling slightly, so that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, 48 tooth blade is obviously will give you a finer finish, uh, although they are a little bit more expensive. Although the trend one isn't that much actually; it's about 20 20 pounds or so. Uh, and obviously, uh, a 24 tooth blade will be a better thing to use if you're ripping natural timbers. Uh, but a 48 tooth blade is a great general purpose blade. Uh, I used it for years and years and years in my pistol. Uh, but as I say, I've switched to a, what they call a 28 tooth universal blade uh, for most of the work now. And I really can't see much of a difference uh, between either of them. But I think we'll leave it there for today. Uh, join me in part four, where we talk a little bit about dust collection, dust extraction, uh, and also a couple of helpful jigs to take care of those narrow rips and cross cuts. I'll see you next time. Take care.